I first found out about the idea of autonomous cars as an elementary school student in the early 2000s. While new to me, it had been a science fiction sign of the future fantasy that had been foretold for decades. And thanks to this video's sponsor, Waymo, that fantasy may now be considered reality. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The car emblazoned upon the colorful pages was NavLab 6, a vehicle from an autonomous car project at Carnegie Mellon University that dated back to the early 1980s. The original NavLab is hilarious by today's standards. It's a bus, in essence, with three high-end workstation servers, video and laser hardware to scan the road, a GPS receiver, and a warp supercomputer with a massive 10 megaflops of compute power. Well, massive for the time, a modern smartphone is literally millions of times more powerful. The first autonomous car it was very slow, with a maximum speed in the first five years of development of just three miles per hour, and its list of limitations could not even begin to be numerated. The car that I saw in that magazine nearly 20 years later was a much different story. It had the ability to not only stay inside of a freeway lane, but also to regulate its speed based on the traffic ahead. Impressive. So the question becomes, well, then why didn't it ship to consumers? Cost, primarily. I found an estimate that the vehicle, camera, computing power, and comically large equipment necessary to power the minivan size system likely cost in excess of $150,000 per car. As has been proven through the ages, uh, transistors, well, they get more dense and less expensive over time. And nearly all of that stuff that the early 2000s NavLab vehicle could do, well, it can now be had in a car just over $20,000. As such, it's only reasonable to assume that the cutting edge tech of today will also be available to us in the future. The mental disconnect for me, the part where I just sit in my chair dumbfounded, is that today you can literally call a Waymo One ride hailing vehicle that will pull up without a human behind the wheel and the car will safely drive you to your destination, fully autonomously, without any human intervention. This exists. Now, lots of companies are taking a crack at various levels of autonomy or self-driving as it's often inaccurately called, but Waymo, a Google sister company, is widely considered to be a leading expert in the field. And as the only company with a public-facing, fully autonomously driven vehicle available today, they have some pretty firm opinions on how autonomous driving should be done. I, and a few others, had the chance to sit down with Waymo engineers and talk about the state of autonomous vehicles. Before we talk about what Waymo is, it's important to talk about what Waymo is not. Waymo isn't an automaker. Their combination of software and custom engineered sensors and compute hardware is marketed as the Waymo driver. And Waymo driver tech, well, it can be placed anywhere, be it a Waymo One ride hailing vehicle, a Waymo Via semi truck, or anything in between. The Waymo driver is also something that you just can't stroll down to the store and purchase and glue onto your car. See, Waymo's original vision when it began as the Google self-driving car project was drastically different than their vision today. In 2012 to 2013, they began loaning out test vehicles to Google employees with strict instructions that they must pay attention to the road. And well, what they quickly discovered was that the people who had agreed to pay attention weren't. <laughs> they became complacent with the car doing its thing, even though, at the time, the car was supposed to be under strict supervision and ready to be disengaged at a moment's notice. I own a car that drives itself well on highways a lot of the time, and I have to admit that even I have the tendency to get maybe more distracted than I would if I were doing the driving myself. And while the software is good, it isn't even as good as an alert human driver. And, and it's this catalyst of imperfect driver assist software and human recklessness that can make for a literal deadly combination. Waymo decided that the only fitting solution was to just remove the human driver from the equation entirely. Not only would it solve roadway issues, but it could also provide mobility access to all. No driver's license or human intervention required. It took more than 20 million miles driven on public roads and more than 20 billion miles in simulation to create what the Waymo driver is today. And the Waymo driver of today, well, it's kind of like the NavLab from decades ago, best in class, but also not yet available for mass public adoption and implementation on individual vehicle ownership. 
But that doesn't mean that Waymo can't offer you anything now or into the future because it can and it will. The Waymo driver is considered a level four autonomous system. No human driver is required for safety and passengers can even fall asleep in the car. That said, autonomous driving may be limited to certain conditions and require specialized maps restricted to an operational design domain. The Waymo driver system requires custom HD maps to provide locational context. That way, its sensors can focus on changes to the environment thanks to the prior knowledge of what the miles ahead are supposed to look like, which improve rider safety and comfort. The areas in which the Waymo driver operates have to be mapped ahead of time, and severe weather can be tough on some of the vehicle sensors. However, with sensor fusion and robust sensor cleaning, the car is smart enough to handle a bunch of different traffic situations, it can navigate through parking lots, it can park, and most importantly, it can handle emergency situations by pulling safely off the road if something goes wrong. As a comparison, my current Tesla autopilot system is a level two system and the upcoming full self-driving beta, well, it's also a level two system. Now, while the beta will drive in drastically more traffic scenarios than existing Tesla lane keeping, the driver is still expected to maintain full attention to the road ahead and be able to intervene at any time without forewarning. Level three remains stuck in the middle, and many experts believe that it may not be the best option for general untrained consumers. Now, while it still requires a driver for emergency purposes, it assigns the monitoring functions to the system, meaning that there is a potential for the driver to do some other things until the system will need them for backup. Now, I took a ride in a Waymo One vehicle in 2019 before the safety drivers were removed. And even then, I was surprised by how smoothly and how confidently it operated. There were very few instances where I would have noticed that I wasn't being driven by a skilled chauffeur. If you're interested in the video I made back then, check it out after this one. In Chandler, Arizona, where the Waymo One ride hailing service operates, the company gathered publicly available information on every fatal crash to have occurred in the area over nine years. In simulation, they had outside experts reconstruct the accident scenarios, and then Waymo simulated those crashes, replacing each human driver separately with the Waymo driver. When the driver initiating the crash was replaced, the Waymo driver never once got into an accident. Very impressive. But how does Waymo manage this level of precision? Well, a lot of it is thanks to its hardware stack, and Sam Kansara, senior product manager at Waymo, explains it well. The three different systems for providing, I guess, the situational awareness, you have the LiDAR, the vision, and the radar, do they all kind of feed into a central hub or like feed into each other so that it's comparing the reading from the LiDAR and the vision and the radar to like cross-check and error check certain readings? Yeah, you're exactly right. Okay. What we actually do for the user is we even show you the three-dimensional world that we are building together based on all of these signals together. We'll show you where we see a car, whether it's close or far away, when we detect a stop sign, when we detect traffic lights changing from red to green. In the way that we do that is by combining all of these three different sensors together and generating our view of the world. The quality of your sensors determines the quality of data that you can gather. In turn, that directly determines the quality of machine learning you need to build on top. Uh, you need good bricks to build a strong house. Waymo's director of engineering, Chen Wu, talks about Waymo's unique perception element. Uh, this is not just uh, object detection or basic understanding. We do try to achieve very high level understanding. For example, different type of pedestrians, cars, what are they going to do? So it gets pretty complicated. And, uh, and also, even though it is uh, very intuitive for humans to understand what's happening in the cameras, it's not that easy for uh, machines. And thanks to all the advances of deep learning and computer vision, I think these years, in the past few years, we've seen really a great groundbreaking technologies enabling a very, uh, very high quality and uh, detailed understanding from the sensor data. And this is a very high level, you know, what does the system do? So it takes the raw sensor data and then it converts it, convert it into a very, you know, compact, but also structured understanding of the scene. Um, if, if you think about from an informational processing uh, point of view, it goes from very dense data to the left, which are all the pixels, uh, and converts it to a metadata, which are the objects, relations, and trajectories. 
In the meantime, it also converts from the perspective view of, of the sensor, same as humans, you, you look at things in a perspective view, but it converted into a top-down view, which is actually a 3D representation that you know, uh, unifies how the, the downstream system consumed this uh, 3D information. But perceiving the state of the Waymo vehicle and the objects around it, well, that's only part of the battle. While we as humans predict the behavior of others from using judgment based on our own experiences, the Waymo driver deliberately calculates the likelihood of future actions of the many various objects around it. Why? Well, Shilpa Gulati, head of behavior prediction at Waymo, explains. So as you see, if we do this for all objects in the world, it's a lot of information. Uh, However, this is very useful information and planner uses it in a principled way in a probabilistic reasoning framework to plan safe and comfortable motion of the Waymo driver yet making progress along, along the route. Uh, and while it seems like a lot, this is kind of exactly the information we humans also do it. We do it very intuitively. One of Waymo's most powerful tools is simulation. I mentioned earlier that Waymo has logged over 20 billion miles in simulation. Ben Frankel of Waymo explains how and why that works and why it's important. So, okay, so on the left-hand side, you can see the nice peaceful drive the Waymo driver is having through Chinatown that we just looked at. Uh, and in the middle column, we've injected a hard charging cyclist. So kind of zooming through the, the intersection. Um, so quickly, it barely causes an adjustment by the Waymo driver. Uh, and then on the far right column, um, we've added a much slower moving cyclist and the Waymo driver needs to make a more significant adjustment in that case. And this example also highlights the kind of interactive nature of these types of simulations where the agent does something and the Waymo driver needs to react to it. And then the changes in the Waymo driver also results in the agent in turn making an appropriate response, taking an appropriate action. In various driving scenarios, we can optimize our system for things such as the most comfortable braking speed, how quickly you can turn the car and so forth. And, uh, and then lastly, simulation gives us helpful data regarding our performance and how we interact in the real world, helping verify, validate, and inter iterate new software changes without completely relying on redriving every mile we have driven before. And while real-world driving is essential to our validation process, at least 90% of our notable discoveries in driving behavior are based on tests we do in simulation. There is a lot of concern surrounding autonomous vehicles and their upcoming prevalence on roadways around the world. And I completely resonate with those worries. What level of autonomy should be considered a minimum before deploying these vehicles on the road at scale? How are we determining if the technology is ready to be deployed and can it handle tough and complex situations? How will these hardware and software stacks reach the mass market? Will it change vehicle ownership? And if so, who carries the burdens and liabilities when things go wrong? These questions need to be resolved in the future, and they will. But I really liked Shilpa's answer to the question, what does Waymo offer that makes these worries and problems worth solving? So I think the imagination, as you said, it is, right? Science fiction coming to reality. Uh, um, an intelligent agent that is capable of driving safely on the roads. Uh, not only that, the benefits, right? It is like, it is mobility for all. Uh, so I really feel strongly about it that if you develop a tech, it should serve humanity. Uh, and this is one such tech, It you know, mobility for so many folks who are constrained to their homes, uh, they could have this at their disposal and in our lifetimes, I hope. It won't be tomorrow or next month. Heck, it may be years or decades before this technology truly becomes accessible at scale. But it is coming in our lifetimes. And the benefits that come from increased mobility for those with disabilities, fewer roadway deaths, more productive commute times, lessened road rage, etc. Those are all worth working towards. This isn't a dream anymore. The technology exists. And as we become more educated about the safety it can offer, and as it becomes more accessible to the masses, we'll look back in the years ahead and wonder why we ever just accepted that one and a half million people died annually on roadways. But let's not wait by rejecting today's abnormalities and pushing for the future's realities. Mm -hmm.